is Marika Sardar, and today we're going to learn more about this amazing manuscript in the collection of the Al Khani Museum, an Indian Quran known as the Gwalior Quran. Not only is it the earliest dated manuscript of its period, completed in 1399, but it also includes at the end of the Quranic text a book of divination. So for those of you intrigued by this idea, please stay with me as we walk step by step through the pages of this fantastic Quran manuscript. So as a specialist in the arts of South Asia, the Gwalior Quran is well known to me and my colleagues as one of the few signed and dated documents of what we call the Sultanate period. That refers to the moment in time between about 1192 and 1526 when rule of the Indian subcontinent, including today's countries of Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, was divided up among a number of small Hindu kingdoms and Muslim sultanates. And this is before the moment when the Mughal emperors would unite much of this area under their rule. While we have a lot of architecture surviving from this period, there's a smaller body of decorative arts and manuscripts, that, and these objects don't often have the kind of documentary evidence that allow us to figure out exactly when and where they're made, in contrast to the architectural record. Every year we're putting together more and more information about the arts of this period, but a lot of careful supposition must go into these attributions. So that's why having a document like the Gwalior Quran is so critical to our work, because it includes an inscription at the end of the text, which very helpfully tells us that it was copied out by someone named Muhammad Shaban, resident of the fortress of Gwalior, and on a date corresponding to the Christian calendar, 11th of July, 1399. Without this evidence, we might never have guessed that such a lavish Quran was made at Gwalior at this particular moment in time. In 1399, Gwalior was under rule of the Hindu Tomar dynasty that had recently broken free and established its independence from the sultans of Delhi. The calligrapher and illuminators of the Gwalior Quran might well have been long-term residents there, or one theory is that they had recently escaped from Delhi, which in September 1398 had been brutally sacked by the conqueror Timur. This idea has come about because, in fact, we don't know a whole lot about other manuscripts being produced in Gwalior at this time. Um, and, but Delhi, on the other hand, is much better established uh, in terms of the construction of these kinds of books. But perhaps more evidence will come to light letting us know about the context in Gwalior that would have made it possible for such an elaborate manuscript to have been made. So there are a few remarkable things about this manuscript, aside from its colophon. For it's not just a straightforward copy of the Qur'an. Inside, once you open it, you discover illumination, a variety of notations, as well as commentaries, in addition to the Qur'anic text. This speaks to the way that the Qur'an itself was used and handled by its owners over the centuries before it became enshrined as a museum object. One of the first things you would notice flipping through the manuscript are the double pages of illumination at regular intervals. What you're looking at right now is the pages that open up the text, what you would first see looking at this manuscript. But in addition, there are many other double page spreads, much like this, uh, and these would have marked 1 30th sections of the Quran. This length of text is called a juz, and this is a fairly common way of dividing up the Qur'an so that one could read it over the course of a month. Other chapters, numbers 2, 7, 19, and 38, are also given special treatment, and this, we think, is because they roughly correspond to one quarter of the Qur'anic text, another common way of dividing it up. On the pages of text in between the illuminated spreads, you would notice there's quite a lot going on on each folio. First, you would notice that there are 13 lines of writing in a combination of gold, blue, and red ink. This is the main text of the Quran, and it's completed in what's known as a Bihari script, a script that was used only in India in the Sultanate period, and that's characterized by the use of multicolored inks. 
You would also notice that around each surah or chapter heading, there's additional illumination, and that the scribe has used a new script here to give the titles. This is called full script. You would notice gold dots at the end of each verse, as well as rosettes in the margins that indicate every fifth verse. And in addition, you would see other marks that indicate one quarter, one half, or three quarters of the juz, as well as other groupings of verses and notes as to when the worshiper should prostrate. You would also see other text on the page in addition to the Quran. So this includes a Persian translation written uh, in the smaller Neskhi script under each line of the Quranic text in Arabic, as well as other commentaries, including the Fadullah Surah, which explains the beneficial properties of the chapter or surah it's written next to, as well as annotations regarding the canonical variance in the readings of the text. But to me, the most interesting feature of this Quran comes at the end of the manuscript. After the last chapter of the Quran, after a set of prayers, you come across what is known as a falname. That is to say, a guide to divination and the interpretation of certain Quranic verses. This is not something you typically find in Quran manuscripts, but was uh, rather more common for a certain moment in time up to about the 17th century. The practice of using the Quran as a divinatory text goes back at least to the 8th century in the belief that one is entrusting God to suggest a course of action by submitting to his will. So the Falname in this particular manuscript has the distinction of being the earliest known from anywhere in the world. So this manuscript has a set of instructions in Persian that instruct the user to uh, recite the Surat al-Fatiha, the first chapter of the Quran, um, repeat several uh, prayers, and then to open the Quran to a random page. After that, one is supposed to flip forward seven pages, go down seven lines, and ascertain the first letter of that seventh line. Then you look up the letter in this guide, and depending on that, you are given certain pieces of advice or whether a course of action is a good idea or a bad idea at this particular moment. If you'd like to learn more about this fascinating manuscript, I would direct you to the book shown here on the left, the product of a multi-year project looking at all aspects of the Gwalior Quran and directed by Eloise Brock de la Perriere. If you're interested in the history of Falnames and this uh, very fascinating aspect of Islamic art history, there's a great exhibition catalog edited by Masume Farhad that would also be a great resource. But best of all would be if you could visit the Gwalior Quran in person in our galleries in Toronto.